But I think about what we use, like the actual processes and systems that we're using to deliver on the business goals. I think those are going to continue to evolve and they're going to be, you know, heavily driven by AI. And I think more and more of the manual processes that you see across the go-to-market will go away and there will be a lot more automation that's built in to the design and and we'll all be you know working more efficiently and more productivity productively than ever before so excited to have you here it's going to be such a fun conversation and for folks in the community that this is your first live podcast we host these podcasts with go-to-market leaders like Tessa in the in the community to answer all your burning questions and about everything go-to-market and today we're rev ops specific and I'm pumped to have Tessa here. We met through go-to-market fund yeah. a couple months back and was immediately impressed by both Tessa's background and just her perspective on the market. So I'll give you a quick overview of Tessa and then I'm going to hand it over to her. And as always, feel free to ask any questions in the chat and I'll try to cover them throughout the conversation. But Tessa, quick background on you. You're the VP of RevOps at Zoom Info. Prior to this, you spent almost nine years at Salesforce, Senior Director of Enterprise Strategy and Operations for Tableau Globally, which is awesome. And we have a lot of good themes today from your crazy career path from EA to VP of RevOps and broader challenges RevOps teams face. So maybe to start out, tell us a little bit about your journey from EA to RevOps, because that is not one I hear every day. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you, Alexa. I jumped, obviously, at the opportunity to talk with you. I think even from our first conversation, I was so energized, so inspired by you. So thank you for having me on here. Oh. Yeah. EA to, to be your A lot of people want to talk, talk with me about this. And, and what I think is so funny is that the EA job was the hardest job I ever had. Like full stop. I don't think there was ever a harder job. And I'm so fortunate that's really how I started my career. And I look back and I have those moments where I'm like, okay, I did the EA route. Should I have gone SDR inbound, outbound sales and and have carried a bag or, or whatever they say. And I think back and I actually think where I am today is because I started as an executive assessor, wow. even just the rooms that I was able to be on from like the very first day in tech. And you're sitting there and you're listening to all these incredible leaders talk about this high level business strategy and then how they're going to translate that into the tactical execution. And from day one, thinking bigger picture and thinking, you know, what is it that we're actually trying to achieve? And then, you know, building out your execution plan from that. So that was, you know, something I was exposed to from day one at Salesforce, which was just so incredible. And then I think about, you know, the foundational skills that I have that I think have helped me get where I am. And, and the first is just around communication. So being effective at communication is something that you need. And every job and that can help propel you forward. The second piece I would say is relationship building and relationship management, and then even the ability to influence and, and, and building that skill very, very early on. And then the third, which I would say is probably my superpower, is just the ability to get things done and the ability to, you know, no matter what, know that something has to get done by a deadline. And there is absolutely zero excuse to not execute. I think Building, you know, that grit so early on has has really been what's carried me through. And every job I had, you know, at Salesforce being, you know, starting as an executive assistant to moving into ops and program management to running a PMO to, you know, eventually, as you said, senior director of strategy and operations for enterprise at Tableau, like those are the three foundational things that always carried me through. And so I, I just feel, you know, so fortunate that was my first job. But Again, like EA today, like still, still harder than the VP of RevOps for sure. That is, I never thought about how transferable those skills are. And everything you just listed is super interesting in terms of what you got exposure to as an EA and were able to take that through your career. I'd be curious on your LinkedIn, I know it was EA and then it was kind of EA and chief of staff. Is there a difference between yeah, I just, we don't hear and I can hear you. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So 
technically I was in EA and then I started working as a chief of staff. So I, I think sometimes they can be interchangeable. Interchangeable. I think that no EA or chief of staff is similar, but they're very, very different roles. So if you're an EA, a traditional EA, you know, I think you still are more project focused or administrative focus. And maybe a lot of times they're doing events or whatnot. I think when you think of chief of staff, you start taking on roles that are some somewhat executing on business strategy, if not helping set that business strategy in partnership with the executive that you support. And so, you know, very much my first, I would say year or year and a half in the role was more of that administrative, you know, project management, event planning, offsite planning, a lot of the things that go into that. And then by the time I had gotten into, you know, the second half of that role, I was, fit, you know, bringing together enablement and marketing and product to try to have, you know, streamline programs and campaigns that were reducing the noise for sales, or we would have issues with our compensation plans. And I was bringing together all these different groups to help the the senior executives I support solve for these things. So very much so still had that administrative, but then started going out and really, you know, solving and executing these business challenges that my senior leader you know, had on his plate every day. And so there's a lot of different chief of staff roles. Some are executive level, some are, you know, more entry level or administrative. They're not created equal, but I would say fundamentally a chief of staff is really more in the business and executing, aligning and executing on those, you know, larger strategic initiatives, whereas an executive assistant might be more focused on that day to day. Should have kind of just distinguishing between the two. I've never heard of such a clear, crisp answer there. So super interesting. And I would be curious, have you ever thought that at the time, were you deciding between, you know, career chief of staff EA versus sales versus rev ops? And how did you weigh the differences? Yeah. That, so it's funny. Like, I, I think that was, it was the, the question about whether or not I'll go into sales. And I think at that time, definitely had a lot of feedback that I'd be really good in sales. I think that after being in that role for a couple of years and getting to be in the room and helping execute the strategy, the last thing I wanted to do was go to outbound sales. And I knew that like, you know, you have to go through it and, you know, earn your stripes or, you know, whatever the saying is in order to go and be an account manager. And so I think at the time I, I just being an SDR, BDR, I don't think, I, I think like, you know, EA is a hard job. I think that might be even harder. And I just, I didn't want to necessarily take that step. I think a lot of what the role I was doing, you know, in that EA chief of staff role was very much like pipeline programs, pipeline operation programs and management. And so I was looking at the time for a transferable role. What's funny is if you look at my resume, I went from being in San Francisco as an EA to London as this, you know, program manager for enterprise sales across EMEA. And I'll never forget the conversation I had with my, you know, senior executive at the time. And I said, Hey, I want to do this. And I want to go for this role. He's like, absolutely. I'll help you. You know, this is great. And I was like, yeah. And I want to do it in, in Europe. And he's like, well, that might be harder. And I was like, it's okay. We'll figure it out. I'll figure it. And that goes back to get it done, which was, I was determined. I was like, I want to move to Europe and I want Salesforce to move me to Europe. And they're going to give me this promotion, a new job. And I'm going to figure it out. And luckily I had amazing executive sponsorship in, in Europe that took a chance on me. But I mean, that definitely propelled my career forward. That's incredible. I, I love this get, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on this podcast, but this is like definition of get shit done attitude. Yeah. It's just like, you are just brute forcing your way from EA to sales manager in probably record time. And it's in a new international sponsored move. Yeah. Relocation. That's incredible. So nothing is impossible with Tessa is what I'm learning. <laughs> possible if you work hard enough. I, I completely agree. So when you got in, you made the switch to RevOps eventually. What kind of maybe appealed you to you about being in RevOps? And what was maybe something surprising that if there was anything surprising about it? Sure. So, well, you know, RevOps is a lot of different roles, right? And I think that going into RevOps, I would say, you know, what I loved about it was just creating order and structure and making sure that your focus was how do you make sure everyone is working as efficiently and productively as possible. And so really taking all of these complex things that you need to deliver as part of the go-to-market and being able to simplify them and operationalize them 
and then, you know, make, the, make them in a way that everyone can adopt and understand. Like, I love that. Like, I love creating order and chaos. And so that, it, I think the thing about RevOps that I've learned to love so much, it's, it's taking the things that I naturally love to do and I think that I'm naturally good at and really making it part of my day-to-day and my career. So whether it was the sales operations side, which is, you know, how do you make sure that sales is focused on the right things at the right time to drive the most results? to the processes and systems. So how do you have, you know, the bit, the most simple business processes automated into the systems to drive the right results to, you know, even managing or either the tech stack, it's like all those things about creating order and chaos and driving focus and really driving people to the business outcomes like that. That is the really exciting part, I think, to me. I think one of the things that, you know, as I moved, I was, I came up through really like the sales operations pillar side. And then I expanded into at my role in Zoom in Chippo more into like the business processes and the tech stack and automating the business processes and tech stack was like, I had to really learn the technical side. And so like I came up in a lot of different roles that were heavily shifted to like that strategy and operations, sales strategy and operations side to all of a sudden I was looking across sales and customer success and marketing and looking at, you know, that, that full span. And then also the, the piece that are super technical, which I had never done before. And so I think with any, any time that you're taking on a new role or a new job, like the, the main thing that you need to be is curious. And so I had to be incredibly curious and incredibly comfortable being uncomfortable as I went down into the other different pillars that I oversaw and really learn those things that I didn't come up, you know, come up doing. And I think also going from, I started at Salesforce a little over 10,000 people going to 70,000 people to going into Zoom Info, which was, you know, like 4,000 people. Like those are, that's a very, there's a lot of different problems to solve. And the, you know, the, where you are operating is, is a, a lot different, right? And so going from being maybe living at 10,000, 15,000 feet, to actually having to go down to 100 feet and balancing when you're in 100 feet versus 5,000 feet. Like that's a completely different skill set that I had to build, which is really exciting. And I think that even though I didn't, you know, come up from like a traditional, you know, startup up into a RevOps role where I was building everything myself, I think learning how everything is built and like understanding and being really curious on how it all worked, like that was critical to the success in my role. But I, you know, coming in, I defaulted to what I, what I knew, which was how do I run a really successful organization? How do I have standards and processes in place? How do I re-architect the org to best serve the business? Do I have the right talent in place? You know, all of those things that I found, you know, fundamentally and foundationally knew how to do to be successful in previous roles. I focused on that while I also balanced getting in deep and being really curious and learning all, you know, the, the processes and systems that, that I didn't know before. It's now zooming forward into today, 2024, heading into 2025. So RevOps today, what do you think are the biggest problems that they're facing? Yeah, no, such a good question. Okay. I, I think I, I, I have an answer for you on that. I mean, the softball answer I could say, which is, is absolutely true, but I'll, I'll, I'll get a little deeper than that. But the softball answer is just prioritization. Like that is the number one challenge of RevOps. Like I believe that through and through, which is when you're balancing running the business, changing the business, the enhancements that need to be made, like it's like, how do you get everything done and bring everyone together and make the decisions about ultimately what you're going to execute against? Because you're getting asked to do so many things that are far beyond your capacity. I think to make it more interesting or relevant about what we're talking about, I think one of the questions that we're getting from our CEOs, our CRs is, what is your AI strategy? Like, what is our AI strategy? What is our go-to-market AI strategy? And how do you begin to answer that? And so when you think about across all the different things from lead to opportunity, opportunity to contract, quote to cash, there are a million point solutions for AI that you can bring in that may or may not drive some efficiency gains. And so how do you begin to decide, like, what is the AI solution that you're going to prioritize first? So I guess it goes back to prioritization. And then is it going to be the one that is going to drive the most efficiency and drive the most impact? And so, you know, deciding where to start even with your AI strategy, like there, there's a lot that you need to prioritize and figure out. And then even if you were to do every single AI solution that's out there to drive some sort of point efficiency gain and how people are executing, 
there's this idea um, of enablement. So like, how are you going to handle the enablement and the change management that is going to have to go with that? Because that's a real issue that people are already been thinking about is if you have all these AI solutions that is changing fundamentally how people are working, are they going to adopt that? And then ultimately, are you going to get what you're striving for, which is that efficiency gain? So I think like that would be that would be like part one. And then part two, and this is this isn't a pitch, like this is the reality, which is you can't have an AI strategy without a data strategy, right? So what is your foundational data strategy going to be that you're going to, you know, build these AI solutions or AI, you know, agents on top of? And I think a lot of the AI solutions out there or a lot of your business processes from, again, all those lead opportunity, opportunity to contract, quote to cash, is, is living on top of your CRM system. And your CRM system doesn't have good data. It really doesn't, right? So your CRM system has dirty data. Your CRM system doesn't have your total addressable market. And even if you were going to prioritize and go back and clean your CRM, it's still not going to have your total addressable market. And so when you think about like an AI agent or AI solution, I heard a good example our CEO used the other day about bringing in like, you know, an AI SDR. If you want that AI SDR to outbound to, you know, your best next customer that's going to convert, that customer isn't in your CRM. And so you need to be thinking about like, what is taking your first party data and your third party data and merging it together? And what is going to be your virtual data layer that's going to live on top of your CRM system? that you're then going to build your AI solutions or your AI agents on top of. And so, you know, thinking as a RevOps professional, okay, what's your what's your biggest challenge? Yes, of course, prioritization, but AI strategy, okay, yeah, that's that's a huge thing to to tackle. But before you can even get there, you have to think about what is your data strategy and how are you going to take your CRM system and the best B2B, you know, data solution out there and have signals to actually, you know, build your AI strategy on top of. And that is a massive undertaking. And again, like, you know, something that, you know, we're being asked to figure out. It's such a good framing of, I hear this all the time where those and executives, they're thinking, I know I need AI in sales or go to market. I absolutely know that, but I don't even know where to start. Like, what does that mean? What problems are we solving? Who do I need to be involved? I guess even what should the data underlying data strategy be to make sure that the AI is smart enough? And there's different use cases you mentioned in AI SDR and there's multiple others. I would be curious for you tactically, like CEO, CRO comes to you and is like, we need an AI strategy. Like, what does that look like? Is there, are you building like AI roadmaps for your RevOps team, for your go-to-market team? Is it like, you need to get enablement involved or is it kind of like a fluffy thing you just talk about and then ultimately you'll see evolution throughout the years? Yeah, that's it. It's a good question. I like tactical questions. I mean, lucky for me, I don't have to start with what is my data strategy (laughs) to consider. So I've got that part figured out. You know, I think it goes back to you know, looking at, again, like looking at all your business processes across, again, the lead to opportunity, opportunity contract, put to cash. And like, first, it's just like one of the first things that we did when I, I came into role is like, what are all the business processes that exist that are out there? Like, what is actual the process mapping from, you know, every step of the way? And then how efficient or, you know, how efficient is that process today? Or, or what percentage is it automated? And really cataloging, you know, of all the business processes, what are, you know, what does that mapping look like? Are they, you know, what percentage automated are they? Um, are they built to scale? And like, is this a really easy process for whoever has to execute against it to follow? And so starting with current state is so important. And then when you look at current state and like being able to go through and, and you know, you probably or, or working towards having different RevOps professionals that look after those different parts um, of, of the, the processes in the business is having them really look through and as part of their planning when they're balancing, you know, run the business initiatives, change the business initiatives and just enhancements mm-hmm. for them to have a strong POV of how we're doing it today. Is that the most efficient way as possible? Are there 20 steps in the process that could actually be four steps in the process if we were to automate, you know, further or, or bring in some sort of AI? And, you know, what would be, the trade-offs to do that if we were to prioritize that. And so 
when we go into our quarterly planning or our roadmap conversations with those stakeholders, having that strong point of view of let's saying, okay, here are the different change the business initiatives that you're asking for. Here's the, you know, the run the business initiatives that we know we have to do. And here's the enhancements that we're going to continue to do just to, you know, iterate or improve the things that are existing today. Also, here's our strong POV of where we think we could drive further automation or simplify or get, you know, efficiency gains. And, you know, here is where we could potentially bring in AI to help us to do that. Like, I think it goes back to that planning process and figuring out in those different areas of the business, having that strong POV of a RevOps professional of where we could bring in AI. But like, I don't know if it is, but it's not, you know, a blanket approach of like, here is our AI strategy that's going to sit separately from our go-to-market, you know, RevOps execution roadmap and strategy, because ultimately the distraction becomes, we should go out this new cool thing with AI because it exists. And like, hey, did you know other people are doing this? We should try this. Like when we think about AI, we should say like, what are the three to five business objectives that we have or the goals we have as an organization or the KPIs that we're ultimately trying to drive? What are our current priorities that are already in place or what are already on the roadmap? And how do we layer in to that AI to help accelerate that or drive more efficiency in that versus creating something that's net new that doesn't necessarily relate to what we're trying to achieve as an organization. It's incredibly well said and something I see most companies not do. And I'm impressed how you articulated it, which is we need to start with the problem. What are the problems we want to solve? Right. What are those three to five? And then figuring out where there could be AI and automation to optimize versus saying like, hey, here's this cool shiny object of an AI tool that might be able to help you with X, Y, Z, but we're not really sure. And so it's even when us building our own products, we try to think about that as well. Like what are the problems that we're trying to solve before we figure out how to solve them? Right. Speaking of, there's a lot of talk out there of we need AI. And then it seems like a lot of people are frustrated with the AI that they're adopting. So do you have a perspective on what you think are amazing areas that AI can help versus areas that can be maybe a distraction and a toy versus a real problem solver? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it goes back to just like foundationally, what are you, what are you already trying to achieve? And then layering AI to try to accelerate that. So it's, you know, if you're thinking about, I, I think about the future of like RevOps and AI and like, you know, how we start thinking about how we bring in AI in. And I think about how, you know, as, as RevOps professionals, where we really should be starting again is like that top. And I don't know if it's like a pyramid or a circle or whatever the life cycle of RevOps. So we should be starting with what are, you know, the business KPIs that we're trying to achieve, right? Like what is the business strategy? And then after we think about like, what is the business strategy, then where we go today is, all right, what is the business behavior that we're trying to drive? So in order to achieve this, what is the business behavior that we need to drive internally? How do we incentivize for that or compensate for that? So people are, are working towards that. And then we gather these requirements to design our processes and our systems to drive that business behavior that ultimately delivers that business strategy. I think what's really interesting as RevOps professionals is we're not going to start thinking, you know, when we think about business strategy, we go straight to like business behavior. That business behavior might not always be people anymore or in the future. It actually might be sometimes, okay, business behavior, we need sellers to do and we're going to incentivize and then build that into our processes and systems. But it also might be in the future or even today, an AI agent. So I think what it goes back to what are we trying to achieve? And like, how do we leverage AI to achieve what we're already trying to achieve? And like, in some cases, you know, is the business behavior need to be driven by a person or can we get to that ultimate outcome by actually using an AI agent to do the same thing? And so that's where things I think will get really interesting. Super, super interesting. And maybe pulling on that thread a little more on where we're going with RevOps. Do you think that three years, five years, 10 years into the future, RevOps looks the same or do you think it looks massively different or somewhere in between? Oh gosh. I mean, I wish I could predict the future, but I think we are going to continue to evolve with AI. I think, you know, how we solution, um, you know, how we solution and deliver ultimately the, the business outcomes is going to look different. And a lot of it might be automated through AI. I think you're still going to need that RevOps organization that is driving alignment, breaking down silos, making sure that we're focused on the right things at the right time we're prioritizing. 
And, but I think about what we use, like the actual processes and systems that we're using to deliver on the business goals. I think those are going to continue to evolve and they're going to be, you know, heavily driven by AI. And I think more and more of the manual processes that you see across the go-to-market will go away and there'll be a lot more automation that's built in to the design and, and we'll all be, you know, working more efficiently and more productivity productively than ever before. And so I think my advice to anyone who's in RevOps is yes, AI is very scary, but start using it, start understanding it, understand what's out there today and start working towards, you know, having a strong POB of how you could leverage AI to improve your business, even if it's not a priority of your organization today, even if your leadership is really risk adverse and they're not sure if they want to touch it, like be sure that you're an expert, like be an expert and make sure that, you know, you really are comfortable with it because it is the future and it's not going away. And if you don't adopt and evolve with it, like your career in RevOps might not be that, that long. It's funny. My last question I was going to ask you is, it sounds like when you're looking for excellent RevOps people or what made you successful, you look for creating clarity out of chaos. You look for people who can get shit done. You look for people that are curious. And I was going to ask, are you now going to be looking for people that are very passionate about AI and kind of knowledgeable? Is that now a new criteria for you? Yeah, I mean, I think you said it. It's, it's. I don't know if it's they need to wake up every morning thinking about AI, but they need to wake up every morning thinking about being 1% better every day. And not just for themselves, but what they do, right? Like they need to be waking up thinking about every single day of like, how do we continue to iterate and improve and, and get better? And I think that that person who has that mindset, they're immediately going to go to AI because- AI is what's in the, what is the future. And so I think having someone or hiring people that you can tell are to your point, you know, get shit done, very curious, are good communicators, but then also have this mindset of like continuous, like improvement and growth and evolution. Like those are the people that are going to dive in and be really excited about AI. But you know, if they're not excited about AI yet or in the interview, like, I think we can get past that for now. If you're such a first principle thinker of your, you know, we need to go back to just the fundamentals of what business problems we have, what I need to see in my future hires, and then we can figure out where the future holds and where AI is. And I know we're at time, but Tessa, this was amazing. I loved hearing about your background. I loved hearing about your perspectives of RevOps today. I loved, I know you said you couldn't predict the future, but it sounded like you did. And so we'll circle back on this in 10 years and see how we landed. But this was so, so wonderful to have you here. We really appreciate so many great, great, great nuggets of insight. So thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you.